All right, let's go ahead and open up the axe. We are gonna finish this up tonight. Uh, it's actually kind of fortuitous because I'll be gone the next two Thursdays. Uh, Peter is gonna be teaching on Thursdays. John is gonna be teaching on Sundays. Uh, so this is actually at a good point. This will be our final one. I'm gonna finish this no matter what. Uh, so we're gonna have to keep moving through the slides here. I hope I don't get bogged down anywhere. Uh, and then in two, well, I guess it'd be three weeks, three Thursdays from tonight, we'll be back in John 6. So let's just remember why we're here. We're in this passage uh, and we're here because of the principles we learned in John 5. We're not going off completely in a tangent. What we learned in John 5 is that the reason why um, uh, the Jews and the nation of Israel as a whole didn't receive Christ is because they didn't really believe in God, the scriptures, and Moses. That's the last third of uh, John 5. Uh, summed up nicely then, if we flip it through the corollary of that, who are the ones who receive Christ, who receive Jesus Christ? Uh, they're the ones, John 14, 1, who believe in God, know God, uh, uh, are familiar with God, know Him, uh, and belong to him. And when they see the son and hear the son, they see the father and the son and they believe in the son. That's the general principle. It's not absolute. I'm sure there were people who were unbelievers in God uh, and uh, they, through Peter's preaching or through Christ's preaching and the gospel accounts, they became believers in God and his word to them and they were individually saved and their personal sins forgiven. Uh, but what we're really dealing with here, what, why Christ came at this time, why uh, Peter is preaching these things at Acts at this time is because God has now advanced his program with the nation of Israel. He's ready to bring about Israel's national salvation, save the nation, make her into his own great and holy nation, uh, and through her, uh, send his blessings and glory and light out to the Gentile world. So that's why we're here. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to go through this. We're really down. We really should be down in verse 22. So I'm just going to basically read through these just to kind of bring back to the forefront our thinking for tonight uh, with this passage. In verses 13 to 15, uh, remember we've just had the healing of the lame man. Uh, so we could call it a sign, a miraculous sign. Uh, remember uh, the God gave the signs to Israel back in Exodus 4. It all goes back to the Exodus. Uh, he gave a sign. He's done a sign here. Uh, and in verses 13, and 15, 13 to 15, Peter convicts uh, the whole nation uh, of what uh, just happened with their Lord and Savior, uh, their Messiah and King, uh, when the nation put him to death on the cross. Peter explains God has advanced his prophetic program with the nation of Israel by sending his son. Uh, and John, but if we remember John, John is going to indicate those who receive the Son are those who already belong to the Father as a general principle, not an absolute law, but as a general principle. Uh, and uh, and he, John 14, 1 summarizes it. He tells his closest apostles, you believe in God, <laughs> believe also in me. Uh, and that's the way uh, it's kind of kind of working here. That's why Luke draws our attention in Luke 2 at the very beginning before Peter's sermon even begins to the devout Jews. It's to the believing Jews scattered around the world now in, uh, in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Uh, and now they're going to hear Peter preach. And the ones that are going to hear are going to be the ones who already belong to God. He's going to explain uh, to the whole nation, but the ones that are going to hear, for the most part, are those who belong to God. Uh, he's going to explain God has advanced his prophetic program with Israel by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's come to fulfill all that the prophets have spoken about, uh, especially with regard to his suffering and death. Uh, in this first half of the message here. And uh, it's important to realize in these verses, Peter convicts every Israelite of this. Uh, he's talking, he's preaching and teaching the people, the whole crowd. And he says, ye all, you all. Uh, and he convicts them all of this. Uh, and when we have to remember, that, uh, remember uh, a commentator I saw, several of them actually said that the population of Jerusalem would uh, triple 
during these major feast days. Uh, so you could, if you extrapolate that out a little, uh, Peter could be preaching to a crowd that's made up two thirds, two thirds of his audience has just got to town. Uh, they probably don't know anything about Christ and if they know anything at all, it's probably wrong. Uh, he's gonna introduce them to the Advancing God's program. Uh, and the ones who are devout Jews come, are they gonna hear God speak through Peter about his son, about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're gonna be the ones primarily who recognize the Father and the Son and receive the Son. But it go, this conviction goes out to the whole nation. He said in Acts 2, uh, the whole household of Israel uh, is going to, uh, is under this conviction of sin. Uh, and it's not just the leaders. As a matter of fact, it appears that the leaders don't even really come on the scene to, till Acts 4. Uh, they hear there's somebody talking things they don't like outside uh, and they come out to them as he's talking to the people and teaching the people. And he convicts them all uh, of putting Christ to death. There's this national uh, debt of sin. They're all under this national debt of sin. Uh, that he convicts them of uh, denying, delivering up, and putting to death uh, the, their Lord and Messiah, God the Son, the God's Son he sent to fulfill the Davidic covenant, uh, that either fulfilling Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant, uh, they are put to death the Holy One and the Just One of Israel. The, they put to death the Prince of Life, but God raised him from the dead. So that's what we have in those verses. Uh, then in verse 16, probably the critical verse in this whole uh, passage, we talked about this quite a bit. God has given them another, He God is, is giving them, I mean, from our perspective, he gave it to them in the past, but if we just go into this passage here, here God is giving them another opportunity, uh, the it, nation itself, to another opportunity to access the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name as embodied now in the person of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's up in verse 6, and he's, I, Peter identifies him as the Lord uh, back in Acts 2, verse 36. Uh, so it's the Lord Jesus Christ, and like the lame man, they too could be healed. But it all depends on accessing the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name. Remember, they, he, God gave Israel that name to access his grace. That's the source of his grace for Israel. That's where they're going to find the grace to be made into the nation God created and designed them to be, and he gave it to them back in Acts 3. So here we have, he gave them the name in Acts 3, he gave them signs in, excuse me, he gave them the name in Exodus 3, he gave them the signs in Exodus 4, he's giving them the opportunity to go back before they foolishly entered the law according to the flesh in Exodus 19, Exodus 19, 8 to be exact. Uh, and he, they're giving him, he's giving them another opportunity to go back uh, and uh, back really to Exodus 18 and make, the, dis, dis, make a better decision, uh, answer the exam question better the second time around. Then in verses 17 and 18, uh, God has accepted Christ's prayer on the cross of their ignorance, uh, which reduced the charge from murder to manslaughter, turning Jerusalem into a city of refuge, uh, where devout Jews from all uh, around the world uh, could seek safety and refuge from their association with Israel's national debt of sin, especially the sins Peter's been enumerating here and convicting them of. They put their Messiah and King, Lord and Savior to death on a cross. That's what the previous verses said. He's convicting everyone in his audience. Most of his audience wasn't there, so it can't be their personal uh, sins. It has to be their participation in Israel's national uh, debt of sins. He convicts the whole nation uh, of that, uh, and uh, he, bring, he allows the plea of ignorance. Of course, for most of the people, when they came from uh, hundreds of miles away to Jerusalem, and they hear Peter preaching here at Pentecost, and there Peter is convicting them of putting to death their king and, save, king and Messiah, uh, most of them, are, it, they did participate in it, completely ignorant. They have an absolute, true, a genuine, ignorance, uh, of course, but then he includes at the end of verse 17, also your rulers. 
uh, but he's even going to let the rulers uh, plead ignorance. Now, they should have known, they could have known, uh, but they didn't know because of unbelief. Uh, they rejected him in unbelief. They didn't understand uh, he was fulfilling what the prophets had spoken about. They didn't understand uh, the uh, centrality of that cross. Uh, they didn't understand these things, and he's going to let them off the hook the first time. Now we're at the second time. He's going to give them another opportunity. And now there's no excuses. Uh, John 8, I forget the verse, but John 8 explains when ye, uh, when the Israel puts him up, lifts him up on a cross, they will know I am. They will know that Jesus Christ is the, the Lord. He's the embodiment of that I am Jehovah name uh, in their presence. And they have no excuse now when you get to Acts uh, 3. So he's going to let them uh, plead ignorance, and he's going to give them a second opportunity in a city of refuge uh, and make that uh, a possibility for them. Uh, through faith in his name, that's really the key thing. Through faith in his name, uh, he's now embodied in the person of Jesus. They access the grace resident in that name. Uh, that will lead to their is Israel's national repentance and national confession of sins in accord with Leviticus 26, 40 to 45. Uh, then they'll be converted. They'll be removed from the curses of the law and the courses of punishment, and they'll return back to where God wants them to be. That's that converted uh, idea. That's that be converted, return back home. Uh, return back to the place they belong. And where they belong is not in Exodus 19. Where they belong is Exodus 18. And Exodus 18 is where God gave the final exam on the wilderness journey, or excuse me, on the Exodus journey, through the wilderness, I guess there, but through uh, the Exodus journey. Uh, and they chose, uh, he gave them two options in Exodus 18, uh, accessing the grace in his Jehovah name whereby he does everything for them and they can't do it and they, he, they rely on him to do everything for them and they're up on the mount uh, together with the gen and the Gentiles are with them uh, worshiping and praising the one true God with Israel and through her rise. That's the first half of Exodus 18. Or they can go along with the second half of Exodus 18. There's Moses uh, being worn out and ruined, spending all day from sunrise to sunset, delineating the laws, telling the laws to the people, the commandments to the people. Uh, and it, he's going to be, uh, his father-in-law says that if he continues, like it's going to bring him to ruin. It's going to wear him out and bring him to ruin or they can go to a law system according to the flesh and it's going to wear them out and bring them to ruin. And what do they do in Exodus 19.8? We will do what all that you say. What should they have answered? What would have been the right answer? What's the answer that that believing Israel is going to give at Christ's second coming in that second Exodus? They're going to plead with God to treat them graciously. They're going to plead with God to do everything for them because we can't do it. Put us back on your eagle's wings and fly us along and bring us to yourself. And he'll usher them in the kingdom, in, into the land, plant them in the land, make of them a great nation, and through them set up his earthly kingdom of righteousness. All right, uh, so they needed to return to that, their rightful place. Their rightful place, what got them in this mess was their answer in Exodus 19.8. We will do all that you say. We'll make ourselves into a great and holy nation. We'll do it ourselves. We can do it. They're going to go back to Exodus 19, be converted, return back to the place God designed, desires them to be. And this time they're going to answer, instead of choosing the B choice to the question, they're going to choose the A choice. Lord, you have to do it all for us. We can't do it. You proved it to that in the Exodus. And at that second coming, they're going to do that. They need to return to their rightful place. 
uh, before they entered that law system according to the flesh. Uh, this would deliver them from the curses of the law and the courses of punishment. We learned that, we won't turn there, but if you, uh, Leviticus 26, 40 to 45 explains what's gonna happen when they, uh, to escape, to be freed from the courses of punishment. They need to participate in Israel's national repentance, national confession of sins. Uh, and that, is that sound like what Peter's inviting them to do in Acts 3 and Acts 2? Uh, and that will deliver them from the curses of the law and the courses of punishment, and then God will remember his covenant with Abraham. And he, what's the two major promises in Abraham? If you had to kind of narrow it, well, there's three. Uh, the first two are he promised them a land and he promised them a people, the multiplied seed of Abraham through the line of Isaac and Jacob. Uh, and he's going to make them into his own great nation uh, and through them be a blessing to the rest of the world. That's the, the way of, that's the way the prophetic program works. Uh, he would gather believing Israel, then he'll gather believing Israel, plant them in the land, establish their earthly kingdom. Uh, in other words, uh, in Acts 1-6, where most commentators say uh, the 12, well, of course, then it's 11, the 11, after 40 days of post-resurrection training about the kingdom from the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who's opened up their understanding in the scriptures. And they, commentators today, come along and say they, were, they, they still don't understand after 40 days of that and three years with them in this earth, they still don't understand the kingdom. Obviously, Jesus meant a spiritual kingdom. And they're still asking about a physical, literal kingdom of Israel in a land in the Middle East. Uh, well, uh, the only fools are the commentators that say that. Uh, the 11 knew exactly what they were asking, and he explains in, these passage, in this passage how he's going to fulfill it. He's going to usher in those times of refreshing and the times of restoration. The times uh, cor of refreshment correlate uh, with, uh, through the presence of the Lord Jesus, correlate with that new covenant blessings. Uh, and, the, and one of the main New Covenant blessings is the giving of the Holy Spirit. See, they weren't given the Holy Spirit when they were individually saved. You go through the Old Testament, people were given the Spirit uh, at times and uh, for short periods of times or uh, for specific uh, purposes. Uh, but for us, see, we can't mix the two programs together. For us, uh, we receive the Spirit the minute we're individually saved. That wasn't the case in God's prophetic program with Israel. David had the Spirit, but it wasn't that when he was individually saved. Uh, he received the Spirit when he was going to write Scripture uh, and at other times when God had special uh, messages for him and his battles and things like that. And he temporarily, the Spirit would come upon him. Uh, and he even prays at one point that uh, don't take away the spirit because the spirit's going to leave him. Uh, the spirit wasn't associated with individual salvation in God's prophetic program with Israel. The spirit was associated in God's prophetic program with Israel with their participation in Israel's national salvation. Can't get the two mixed up. If you get them mixed up, then you're going to think this is, a, and you think this is about individual salvation, uh, then uh, it's gonna, it's, it's just, you're just going to get confused. You're going to think water baptism is required. Uh, you're going to think that, and if, especially if you think this applies to us today, uh, this giving of the Spirit was a new covenant blessing uh, on behalf of the nation of Israel. It's a national blessing. Believing Israel will receive the Spirit in their heart of faith, uh, and he will, he will put the law in their hearts and cause them to obey its commandments, cause them to walk in the commandments of the Lord. And then they can receive the blessings of the law rather than its curses. Uh, when at Sinai in Exodus 9, 8, they said, we will do it ourselves through the power of our own flesh. We'll do it through our own power. And the next 1,500 years, they were under the curses of the law and the courses of the punishment because they couldn't do it through their own power. 
The new covenant provides the nation uh, with the spirit who's going to do the commandments for and through them and cause them. It's going to be the law according to the spirit, uh, the power of the spirit, rather than the law according to the power of their own flesh. Uh, and we see this chain, this going from uh, these blessings. I guess let's go over, keep a bookmark here in Acts, but let's go uh, over and let's just follow this through a little bit. Go to Deuteronomy, second giving of the law here. Deuteronomy 30. Uh, and uh, let's just read through some of this uh, and see what they needed to do if they were going to be under a law system according to the flesh. This is, here's the requirements. Uh, and it shall come to pass, this is Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse. Now he's gone through this whole book, and if we read the whole book, we'd see uh, he's basically telling them they're going to come under the curses. He knows they're going to come under the curses. Uh, and uh, he's going to tell, give them some hope, though, uh, because God isn't going to leave them under the curses. He's going to deliver them from the curses. And let's just read some more here. Uh, and verse 2, And shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, and thy children with all thine heart and with all thine soul. I see what Moses is telling him here. You've, and you've re, uh, agreed, <clears throat> covenant, contracted, whatever, uh, with God to treat you on the basis of how well you keep the law. If we don't keep it, uh, curses on us. If we do keep it, blessings. Uh, and here's the key phrase, though. This is, and again, this is a theme that goes through all of Deuteronomy. We'll just read it here in verse 2 because we get them both in this one passage. Here's the requirement. Here's the key to keeping the law that Israel couldn't do uh, through the power of their own flesh. That is, at the end of verse 2, To all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. It had to come from the heart. Hearts of faith. That's the only way you're going to keep the law. The law wasn't designed to be a set of external requirements uh, that uh, people would keep externally. It, it only had merit, it only had benefit if it came from hearts of faith. And that's the big problem uh, for the nation of Israel. Let's keep reading. They, uh, Moses tells them in the book of Deuteronomy, they're not going to be able, he says earlier, he calls it circumcising the heart so they can love God with all their soul, uh, what is it, soul, mind, and hearts. Uh, love God completely from the inside out. But all they can generate on their own through the flesh is, is uh, external religious system that had the appearance of loving God but didn't really. Verse 3, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee uh, and will return uh, to, and gather thee from all the nations. That's what we've been talking about. Does that give you a little picture of Acts 3? Whether the Lord God hath scattered thee if any of thine be driven out in the outermost parts of heaven from thence, will the Lord thy God gather thee from thence? He shall fetch thee. Uh, now we have a foretaste of this a little bit in Acts, early Acts. Of course, it's going to be culminated and completely fulfilled at Christ's second coming. And the Lord thy God will bring you into the land that the fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above the thy fathers, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. See, when they are under these curse courses of punishment, curses of the law, they agreed to do it themselves. They agreed to circumcise their own heart, and they couldn't do it. God, the new covenant, provides them that God himself is going to circumcise their hearts. And that's what we're going to look at as we follow this trail as we go through the rest of the Old Testament here. Uh, and then they'll receive the blessings. Uh, let's, keep, uh, let's keep going. Verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. They can't circumcise their own heart. That's what they told God they would do, but they can't do it. So the Lord's going to do it for them. 
uh, and uh, the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and that thou mayest live and the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon your, their enemies uh, and on them that hate thee which persecuted thee and thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day and the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand and fruit of the body and fruit of the cattle and fruit of the land for good and the Lord will again rejoice uh, over thee for good as he rejoiced over your fathers if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord to keep his commandments and his statutes uh, that are written which are written in the book of the law uh, and if you turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul uh, and that's the big uh, issue for Israel. They said, we'll do it ourselves, but they agreed to do something that only God can do. And he's going to do it for them. He's going to circumcise their heart. He's looking ahead to this new covenant. He's going to circumcise their heart, their heart so he can, they can walk in his commandments and receive the blessings of the law rather than its curses. So the question is, how are they going to do it? So let's follow the trail. Go to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. This is all about the new covenant. Uh, and let's, we're going to verse 33, but let's at least read verse 31 first. Jeremiah 31, uh, verse 31. The question is, how is he going to circumcise their hearts? Uh, how is he going to do that? Uh, and here he's, how is he going to get them to be able to follow the commands of the law? And he's going to say this here, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make, the, make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now that tells you who the new covenant with. So if you're listening to a teacher that says new covenants for the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace, uh, you, need to, you know you're going to need to take a rake and throw that away. Rake it up and throw it in the bin. Because God explicitly says the new covenant he's made with the nation of Israel. Go down to verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. He says it again. Uh, and after these days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So they agreed to enter this law foolishly back in Exodus 19.8. Forty years go by or so, Moses gives them the law the second time and says that the ingredient you're missing is you have to circumcise the heart uh, and everything begins with loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Then by the time you get to end of the Deuteronomy, he explains to them they're not going to do it. They're going to suffer all the curses of the law, and they're going to enter the courses of punishment that's going to ultimately relate in the complete ruin of the nation, uh, and they're exiled out of the land, the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And even in the days of Jesus, uh, while some have returned, uh, the nation is still in exile. Uh, most of the Jews are still out among the Gentiles, and even the Jews in the land are ruled by the Gentiles, who are ruled by Satan. So they're still really in exile uh, in the days of Jesus. Uh, and he's going to, because they, have, they haven't circumcised their hearts. It all begins with faith in the hearts. That would then cause them from the hearts to love God, uh, which would then... Uh, result in external things. Instead, what did they do with the law? They just turned it into an external set of regulations. Uh, and uh, by th they thought just by doing these external regulations, we uh, can be a, 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 uh, related to God. So they missed it completely. They go into ruin. They go into the curses of the law. They go uh, ultimately exiled from the land. Uh, and he promises, though, Moses, on his closing words, said, there's going to come a time, though, God is going to circumcise the heart so that you can love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you can be his people, and he can be your God. And the first thing he's going to do, the first thing he's going to provide for is he's going to take the law written on external stones, and he's going to write them in their heart instead. That's the first step. Well, how does that help them? We'll go to Ezekiel now. Ezekiel 36. So how does it help to have the law written in the heart? 
Well, because he's going to give them something else at the same time. Exodus, excuse me, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. A new heart will I also give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart. Remember over and over in the Old Testament and uh, other places, yes, Israel's heart is hardened. He's going to take out their hardened heart, and he's going to put in a softened hearts of faith. I give you a heart, of, uh, a heart out of your flesh. Take it out of the flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, since take out the hardened heart out, put the softened flesh, soft heart in. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. So here we have the second ingredient. Uh, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So here we have the key ingredient. Uh, way back in Deuteronomy, Moses says at the beginning of Deuteronomy, the only way you're going to be able to do the law is if you, do, if you circumcise your hearts first uh, so that you can love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He's going to acknowledge by the time you get to the end of Deuteronomy that they can't do it. They're going to come under the curses. They're going to go into the courses of punishment. The nation is going to be completely ruined. But there's hope. God is going to circumcise their hearts. And he's going to do that, Jeremiah 31, through a new covenant, whereby he's going to write the law, not in external stones, but in the heart, the soft hearts, uh, the soft, their soft hearts of faith. And then he's, and he's going to give them the spirit who's going to empower them to walk according to the commandments of God. Uh, what, where they failed for 1,500 years tr saying we're going to walk according, we're going to do God's commands uh, through the power of the flesh, our own flesh. God's going to accomplish uh, g uh, by causing them to walk in his commandments through the spirit. They, they're gonna be, uh, that's going to be the law according to the spirit. And the law according to the Spirit is going to cause them to walk in His commandments so now they can receive the blessings of the law rather than its curses. And they can, uh, and that is what the basis of that kingdom is going to be based on. And they're going to enter that kingdom and He's going to make of them uh, a great nation ex finally experiencing the blessings of the law. Uh, and so that's what these times of refreshing uh, these times of refreshing. Now, don't leave Ezekiel. I started to turn back, but keep staying Ezekiel because uh, we'll see this replacing of the curses here. Look at verse 28. So he gives them the Spirit who writes the law in their hearts and causes them, empowers them to walk according to the commands. Why? Verse 28, and ye shall dwell in the land. So they can dwell in the land. He begins to fulfill the promises to Abraham and the other uh, prophets of old and I gave, that I gave to your fathers. And ye shall be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. Uh, we read about that in Acts 2 and 3 too, that being separated from Israel's national debt of sin. So he can make of the believing Israel his own nation, debt-free nation. And he says, I will call for the corn uh, and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field. And ye shall receive no more reproach of famine and heathen and all this. He's going to go through now. And uh, hopefully that verse sounded familiar because that's from, we read that back in Deuteronomy 30 as one of those blessings of the law. The blessing, the fruit of the body, the fruit of the field, the fruit of the cattle. If they're going to receive the blessings of the law rather than its curses. Uh, and uh, they'll, God will make of them a great nation. Uh, but it all comes through this new covenant whereby he's going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. So he's going to replace the law according to the flesh with the law according to the spirit. And that's going to empower them uh, to be removed from the curses of the law uh, and be brought into the, and receive the blessings of the law. Uh, these other two we won't uh, turn to, but you can look on your own because uh, oftentimes uh, we read about how a time when the law is going to be refreshing, when it's going to revive, when it's going to be easy. And that's what this is talking about. Under that new covenant, the law will be easy. The law will be a blessing, the refreshment, and it'll bring about reviving. 
uh, because what they couldn't do through their own flesh, the Spirit is going to do for them. All right, so let's go back to Acts. Acts 3. And we have here, God will send, pick it up at verse 20. Verse 20. Uh, so we just got done talking about there, we join in Israel, uh, access the grace resident, his I am Jehovah name, uh, by faith. Uh, that will bring about your participation in Israel's national repentance, national confession of sins. That will take you back to where God wants you to be, to where you belong in Exodus 18 instead of Exodus 19. And now you can make a choice again. Uh, is it going to be grace? Or is it going to be a law? You chose the wrong thing the first time. Uh, you're going to receive the second. You're going to answer the question the right time the second time. Uh, plead with them to deal with them graciously. He's going to forgive uh, their association, separate them from their association with Israel's national debt of sins that he just convicted them up above of denying and delivering up and putting to death their Lord and Savior, Messiah and King. Uh, and then they'll bring in, verse 19, bring in the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, who's the Lord? Go back to Acts 2. Acts 2, verse 36. He tells them in that who the Lord is. Uh, Therefore, Acts 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, the whole household of Israel, uh, that God hath made this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Uh, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Put it all together there. Uh, he's the Lord. He's the embodiment of that I am Jehovah name. He's the, it's through him, they can, through faith in him, that they can access the grace resident in that name that will bring about Israel's national salvation and make them participants in it. Participants in the times of refreshing, which we just read about, and the times of restitution of all things. Uh, so he's either going to go convert, convert back to their home base back in Exodus 18. Uh, before they you know, said what they said and agreed to what they agreed in Exodus 19.8, uh, and they're going to pick grace the second time. They picked the wrong answer the first time. They're going to pick grace the first, the second time. Uh, and it's Jesus Christ, uh, who is Lord. Uh, we saw that in Acts 2.36. Uh, and, of course, that should remind you of one of those uh, Jehovah compound names. Uh, the Lord is there. Remember, the Lord uh, is my shepherd. The Lord is my righteousness. The Lord is uh, my healer. The Lord is my provider. The Lord is my banner. My uh, People put in their conquering hero, uh, a, the one who defeats his en their enemies. Uh, and that's over in Ezekiel. 48.35. Uh, so what he's saying is here, verse 20, so who is the Lord? The presence of the Lord. Who is he going to send to, in, the, in the presence of the Lord to bring about the presence of the Lord? Verse 20, and he shall send Jesus Christ, uh, who before was preaching. He's the Lord. He's the access. Uh, through him is access to the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name that will bring about heal, not only brought healing to the lame man in, in the beginning of the chapter, but he can, is the one who will bring healing to the nation of Israel. And then the seasons of rest and seasons of restitution will be brought in. Verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Uh, now, uh, we looked at the times of refreshing last time. We looked at uh, some few things associated with that. Uh, Exodus, or excuse me, Isaiah, the end of Isaiah 59 going into Isaiah 60. Uh, he's going to call, the Lord is going to come, the Redeemer is going to come to Jerusalem. Remember devout Anna and Simeon? They're looking for the consolation, the salvation of Israel, the consolation. Does that sound like times of refreshment? Uh, times of restitution, the consolation or salvation of Israel that begins with redemption in Jerusalem. 
uh, and the Redeemer is going to come to Zion, come to Jerusalem, uh, and provide redemption of Jerusalem through, and when re Jerusalem's redeemed, the nation will be redeemed, and when the nation is redeemed, God will make of her his conduit of blessings to the rest of the world. This, these uh, seasons of rest and refreshment, uh, we could kind of look at some of these things. Keep, your, keep another bookmark here, and let's just go to a passage you're probably familiar with, Isaiah 11. Uh, if we want to look at this restitution of all things concept, we looked last week at the refreshment concept. Let's look at the restitution, uh, one quick example. Uh, we'll just go to Isaiah 11. We'll pick it up at verse 3. This is the characteristics of the kingdom. Uh, when the Davidic kingdom is set up, uh, and uh, we'll pick it up at verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding. This is, uh, I guess we got to start a little earlier. There shall be a come forth in verse 1, a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch will grow out of Of course, we know this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, and he shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove, the, reprove with equity the meek of the earth. Now, who are the poor and the meek? He's not talking here about the general poor and meek. These are people who are poor and meek, the believing remnant of Israel who's poor and meek because they're being persecuted by the apostate nation and enemy Gentiles. And he's going to treat them right. He's going to turn everything upside down. Uh, the persecutors uh, are going to receive, uh, been destroyed, uh, and those they, they were trying to destroy are going to be lifted up. Uh, verse 4, uh, and that's what he goes on to say here. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And, the right, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Uh, and here's this times of restitution. The wolf shall uh, dwell with the lamb. Uh, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Uh, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like a fox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of an asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Uh, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all the, his holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there we have a little kind of uh, metaphorical picture uh, of, uh, in, in referring to these common everyday things, but are really representing what the restitution of the earth through uh, the nation of Israel and uh, their earthly kingdom. All right, the seasons of rest. Let's go back to Acts. The seasons of rest, uh, the seasons of rest and refreshment uh, that comes from the presence of the Lord. If I can get back to Acts 3 here. Comes from the presence of the Lord sitting on David's throne. We saw that in Acts 2, verse 30. Uh, and I just referred to in Isaiah 59 and 60. Uh, bringing about the con and consoling, uh, times of refreshment, cons consolation. Uh, re, the, and saving the nation of Israel, beginning with redemption in Jerusalem. And we kind of talked about that. That goes all the way back to the devout uh, Jews, Anna and Simeon. And it would go to back to the devout Jews who are in town for Pentecost. Luke mentioned early in the early uh, Acts 2. Uh, true believing Jews from around the world who have gathered now uh, and are and they're being uh, taught uh, that God has advanced his program by sending his son and now receive the son. And he'll receive the son. He'll bring you into access of the grace rather than high as in his I am Jehovah name that gives you act that through which God is going to restore and uh, create his own great and holy nation. And they can be recipients of that, participate in Israel's national repentance and confession that takes them back to the final exam at the first Exodus in Exodus 18. And they can now have picked the first answer 
It's an A and B answer. They picked the B answer and it was wrong. Uh, they're going to pick the A answer this time. Uh, and it's going to usher in God's, and when they do that, the Lord Jesus is going to heal them. Like he did the lame man, he's going to heal them uh, and usher them into the times of refreshing and the times of restitution. Uh, and the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be there with them, ruling on David's throne in Jerusalem. He will accomplish this through his sent one, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Peter's uh, preaching to them. Uh, let's just pick it up here because I don't think we looked at these verses last time. Remember this Exodus concept is, is, the, is the most important thing. Everything is going back uh, to before Exodus 8, 19 at the giving and the giving of the law. Everything's going back. He's given, uh, he, he's re, he made a big deal. Uh, the whole passage really centers on his Jehovah name, that name that is, is the access point uh, to the grace resident there to make Israel a great nation that's given in Exodus 3. He just performed a sign. That goes back to the giving of signs in Exodus 4. He takes them back uh, to be converted. He takes them back to Exodus 18 uh, before uh, Exodus 19 when they went under that law according to the flesh. And he keeps, it all goes back to the Exodus and now it's all brought to the fore. It's kind of brought to a head at, at this point. Verse 22, and Moses, now we actually have Moses who was the leader of the first Exodus. Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your fathers raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Listen to him. There's going to be a greater prophet like Moses, like him, like Moses, God's going to send. And guess what? He's sent him. It's this Lord Jesus Christ. He's sent him. What happens if you don't hear? Verse 23, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So there you have how God's going to save the nation of Israel. He's going to deliver his friends and he's going to destroy his enemies. That's the salvation of Israel. That's the salvation of Israel. He will accomplish this through his sent one. Uh, the, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater prophet like unto Moses, uh, and he's going to, he's, will lead them through a greater second exodus. It's going to be out of the exodus of the apostate nation Israel and an exodus out of the enemy Gentiles, nations. He's going to gather them together, deliver them from their enemies, uh, gather them together, uh, usher them into the kingdom in fulfillment of what the prophets had spoken about since the world began. And especially those prophets beginning with Samuel. Let's read the next ver verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel. Now why does he go back to Samuel? Uh, well, if we take a minute and go to our timeline, uh, here we have, remember, there's no dispensation of grace. This is God's prophetic program with Israel. Uh, of course, we know, oops, we know, uh, now he's put this on hold here, God's prophetic program on hold, is now actively carrying out another program. Uh, and then when that's over, he'll restart his program, prophetic program with Israel. Now he's carrying out his mystery program for the body of Christ. And then I'll go back to this. But if we look uh, back, and actually I thought I had it on here, but I guess I don't. If you go back all the way to number one, the first course of punishment, uh, the name that should be up there is Samuel. Samuel was the first prophet of the first course of punishment. Uh, Elijah was the prophet of the second course of punishment. Elisha, the prophet of the third course of punishment. There is a whole bunch of prophets uh, that he raised up in the fourth course of punishment, getting them ready uh, and given an opportunity to not have to go into the fifth course of punishment, uh, which uh, began with that Babylonian captivity. So he goes back especially to Samuel, uh, and he goes especially back uh, to Samuel, who was the was the at the beginning of the which was the beginning of the courses of punishment, 
and now they've fulfilled the courses of punishment. We're in the fourth, or really have completed the fourth installment of the fifth course of punishment. Uh, the only thing left on Daniel's time schedule is the seven year tribulation period. It's the only thing left. Uh, he's, the courses of punishment are near their end and he's getting them prepared. Get ready uh, if, uh, through this this uh, greater prophet like unto Moses, he's getting ready to take you through another greater exodus. And this time you have to access the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name, uh, plead with him to treat you graciously, tell him you, that he has to put you up on his eagle's wings and carry you along and bring you into his kingdom. It's the only way they're going to go into the promised land of that kingdom. Now they're going to get right what they got wrong in the first time, they're going to get right the second time, bringing them back to Exodus 18. And they're going to give the right answer the second time. Uh, and he's going to accomplish this all uh, through that greater prophet like unto Moses. Uh, he's going to save the nation of Israel. Uh, destroying unbelieving Israel who refused to join in national repentance and confession of sins, uh, delivering believing Israel, uh, those who do join in that, and he will make of the latter his own great and holy nation. And now let's add in here his own great and holy debt free nation, separated uh, from their association with what he's convicted them here in Acts 2 and 3 of, uh, de of denying, delivering up and putting to death their Messiah and King, Lord and Savior. They'll be separated from all that. He's going to create of them a new nation, a debt-free nation, and he's going to give them the Spirit who's going to put the law in their hearts through the new covenant blessings so they never accrue a national debt of sin again. There may be people who commit individual, individuals who commit sins, and it's going to be dealt with in the kingdom immediately, justly, and quickly. But Israel as a nation will never accrue a national debt of sin again. And that brings us now uh, to... Uh, as we, well, I don't think we finished verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets coming from Samuel and those that follow after. So he goes to the beginning of the courses of punishment and he goes to the, all the way to the end of the course of punishment. Where they are now, all that's left is that seven year tribulation period in Daniel's time schedule. And he says, as many of the spoken have, like mind, have likewise foretold of these days. Uh, they've all foretold of these days. Uh, it's what's going on here at Pentecost, contrary to what Christian uh, commentators and theologians and religious leaders say, uh, they, nothing new happens here. There's an advancement in God's old program. Uh, it all has to do with what the prophets had spoken about since the world began. He's not beginning a new dispensation here. He's not beginning a new group called the Body of Christ. He's not beginning the church here, the Body of Christ. Uh, he's not starting the mystery program here. Uh, he's doing stuff that the prophets had spoken about since the world began. Paul comes on the scene, and you know what the Holy Spirit says through him? Paul's preaching uh, has to do with the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the mystery, which God kept secret, didn't speak about since the world began. Two totally distinct programs. Uh, but here we have God's prophetic program with Israel going all the way back, uh, and uh, he's going to bring about ye. Uh, let's just finish reading here. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham. So we've had the new covenant. We had the Davidic covenant in chapter 2 along with the new covenant. Uh, and now we have the Abrahamic covenant, the three major covenants for the salvation of the nation of Israel. And he says here in verse 25, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of, your, of the earth be blessed. The Abrahamic 
uh, covenant pr promise to Abraham that he would have a land, uh, that he would have a people, a multiplied seed of Abraham through the line of Isaac and Jacob, and God would make of them a great nation. And through that nation, he, that nation uh, would be the conduit of his blessings to the rest of the world. Unto you, but here's the requirement. Verse 26, here's the major requirement. Unto you first. See, it all begins with redemption in Jerusalem. Then that leads to the consolation, the salvation of Israel. And that leads to the blessings going out to the Gentiles. That's God's prophetic program with Israel. It all begins in Jerusalem. You can't save the nation of Israel without its capital city, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is refusing. God sent Christ, verse, let's finish 26 here, uh, having raised up Christ, uh, his son sent him to bless you. Uh, here Peter's preaching. Notice it's raised up. He's not talking here about the incarnation when he sent him in the gospel accounts. He's talking about here he raised up Christ from the dead uh, and raised him up. And now he's giving them another chance to be a blessing unto them. If they receive it, access the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name by faith and he'll heal them like he healed the lame man. And they can, will then join in Israel's national repentance and confession of sins that will convert them, take them back to Exodus 18 where they can choose the right answer on the exam question and plead with God to treat them graciously and just to, they can't do it themselves and to keep carrying us along on your eagle's wings and fly us into the land, to the land, bringing us to yourself, usher us into the land, plant us in the land, make of us a great nation, bring in the times of refreshing of Israel, the times of restitution of all things, set up that earthly kingdom, the 11 uh, we're looking for back in Acts 1-6. But it all begins with, uh, it all begins, I guess I don't have a note point on that, uh, it all begins in Jerusalem and Israel. That's the beginning. Without Jerusalem and Israel, it's going to shut down the whole program. And that's what happens before we get uh, too much further into Acts. But here's, we'll just end by looking at one, at finishing this verse here. Uh, and he sent you to bless him. He's given him the second opportunity uh, in turning every one of you away from. Now, if you have a King James uh, Bible here, this is one of those few times uh, when the King James have left a f what I call a fingerprint. It's a big fingerprint. If you go by the King James here, you're going to misunderstand a lot of what's going on here at Pentecost. The King James says, turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Uh, if you have a reference Bible, or uh, the New King James, you'll see the underlying Greek there isn't his singular. It's your plural. And there's a world of difference. The King James translators thought this passage was about individual salvation and forgiveness of personal sins. That's what their theological and their religious system taught. Uh, but we've seen this isn't about that. It's about participating in Israel's national salvation and being separated, forgiven, remitted uh, Israel, from Israel's from association with Israel's national debt of sins. Uh, and it's your plural. Uh, he's not coming along here, and he's not talking about individual forgiveness, of individual and personal forgiveness sins. He's talking about their association with Israel's national debt of sins. And he's calling every one of you, everyone in his audience listening. Most of them weren't even here, but they all hear when he would, Christ was put to death on the cross. But they're still uh, involved in it. They're still associated with because they're Israelites. And it's every one of you from your, we might say today in southern vernacular, because our plural and singular for your is your. Uh, but maybe we'd say y'all. Uh, it's y'all. 
It's the whole group. You all can be separated uh, from uh, Israel's national debt of sins of denying and delivering uh, and putting to death your Messiah and King, Lord and Savior. Uh, that in doing that, you'll access the grace resident uh, in, in uh, the Lord, uh, embodied in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, access the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name that will heal the nation, uh, bring about Israel's national repentance, national confession of sins that will separate them from the curses of the law and bring them out of the courses of punishment and return them back, convert them back to Exodus 18, where they can plead with the Lord to treat us graciously, put us back up on your eagle's wings, fly us to keep flying us to yourself and fly us into the promised land of the kingdom where God will make of them the greatest nation on earth and through them save the world. Let's close with the word of prayer. Uh, oh, well, one other thing. One other thing. Uh, let's just close with this because I don't want to have to bring it up next time. If you need an example of this, uh, I would say that I want to include this Abraham Lincoln uh, example too and, and slavery. Abraham Lincoln called on the whole nation uh, to repent and confess this great national sins associated with slavery. Uh, and it's the same thing going on here in Israel. Uh, Peter's calling on them uh, to uh, join in the repentance and confession of sins uh, of the nation of Israel, just as like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and uh, he's going to now, in, and who is going to join with Abraham Lincoln? Who's going to mostly join with Abraham Lincoln in this repentance and confession? Well, those who believe in the cause, right? Uh, now, there might be some people who change their mind and become believers, but most of them are going to already believe in the cause. Uh, and it's, of course, we see in the Civil War, those who come around and join in the national repentance and confession are delivered. Uh, those who don't are put to death. Uh, poor illustration because we know they died on both sides, uh, but we have the Civil War uh, what Abraham Lincoln was kind of an uh, kind of illustrated. What I'm trying to make this more practical uh, is partially and completely, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is going uh, to do completely and perfectly. And on that note, we'll, I covered all this earlier. On that note, this will take us back to John 6, uh, where we will see Jesus feeding the multitude, bringing in some times of refreshing, giving a foretaste of some times of refreshing. Let's close with a word of prayer.